welcome. Uh, as we have told you that uh, although we're practicing this shelter in place and social distancing, I think it's important for you to feel welcome and connected, which means we need to get to know one another a little bit more virtually. So again, just a quick uh, follow up to Kendra's introduction. Yes, that is me. That's post COVID-19, I actually had hair coloring. So I'm missing my hairdresser, like you I'm sure have some vital components that you're missing right now in the shelter in place. But on a professional note, uh, you'll notice that I work with both government and private sector organizations like NCUA, which is kind of the FDIC for banks, the Federal Reserve Bank. And I'll note that I had about uh, 10 years with the BP, but I will say that my time was before petroleum was spilled into the Gulf. But there were a lot of lessons learned around the correlation between safety, its in the D and DNI, and its impact on the community. So I'll be happy to share some of those. Also, right now, as Kendra mentioned, I am the founder and one of the senior advisors of my own boutique firm, which is Human Resources Diversity Advisors or HRDA. Also, a bit of an opportunity to, to connect with many of you who are in the Chicagoland build environment. I did spend about four years as the host and producer of a television show on Comcast called Builders and Buyers. And during that time, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to connect with many in the real estate construction and other components of the build environment. So again, just a little bit about me, but we want to hear about you as well. So what we'd like to do is actually begin to exercise our, our first poll, if you will, in terms of uh, who's in the room right now and share through our polling process. Bear with me just one second. Uh, it looks like I've got to, I'm going to introduce our first poll. Now, as you'll notice there, you should see a polling panel at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to begin to interact with this poll and to actually, uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble here, so bear with me. I apologize for this. We're gonna relaunch that poll. Okay, so you should be able to see that poll right now. And what that poll is going to do is ask you to really share what sector you're representing today primarily. And the votes are coming in. We're about 57% of the votes in. So we'll give you just a few more moments to acknowledge. Now, we'll say if you're in a decision point of whether you are uh, in any of those, just kind of concentrate on the, the one that you usually operate in. And, of course, there's always the safety measure of other. So let's kind of end that poll. And let's share those results with you as to where we are. And it looks like the majority, 33%, are responding from community-based nonprofit organizations. So again, thank you for your contribution. There is also a large component of government represented in the room today. So welcome at 29%. Uh, private industry is also coming in at 15%. The uh, heart of the matter, philanthropists are representing about 5% of our population. And then the other as about 18%. So any um, components of that, uh, speak to many different dimensions of what's represented in the room. So that is our poll for now. And you can see these results as they come in there. And I will close out that poll right now. And what we'd like to do is continue to share the presentation itself. And so what I would say is regardless of the sector that you're representing today, we're hoping the topics that we're going to speak about, which is shown on the screen right now, really uh, support the work that you're doing. Here's what we plan to cover during our time together today. We're going to talk about why inclusive leadership is essential. Uh, you also may have found that you hear words like fight the virus in terms like win the war when it comes to this COVID-19 a pandemic. So we're going to get a little bit of history or remembrance of history in terms of battle-ready leadership and what it looks like when we define it as inclusive. We'll also talk about uh, some key traits of inclusive leaders that have been identified as best practices. And we'll also speak to the everyday. I would say taking it back to the office, but sometimes now we're taking it back home. We're actually going to give you some suggestions of things you can practice every day to help you become a more inclusive leader. And as I mentioned, 
we'll dedicate some time to address your questions. So please continue to post those uh, in the Q&A section. So since our topic is inclusive leadership, what I'd like to do is help us to learn a little bit more about your role as a leader. So we've got another poll for you. Hopefully I'll do this one with a little bit more ease. So here is our next poll. At what level of leadership do you most often function? So what I would ask you to do is think of the words most often. So I know you uh, have varying roles and varying possibilities, but we're gonna go to the polls again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another opportunity here to allow you to address that question. So again, at what level of leadership do you typically function? Now, if you're a little torn, we include an individual contributor to talk about organizations that you may hold where you are yet. There are no direct reports. Also, if you're a freelancer or maybe a consultant like myself, individual contributors would be a good place for you. Managers, uh, I would put there, managers or supervisors of people. And of course, senior leaders, you are those top level leaders in the organization or an owner with direct reports. And then, of course, we have that safe space of other if none of those get. So it looks like we're getting some last minute entries into that. So I'm going to leave it open just for a couple more seconds here. Uh, there are a couple more of you out there who look like you're trying to decide what level of leadership do you most often function. So it looks like we've got the majority coming in now. So in just about two seconds, I'm going to end the polling for us. Okay. So here we go, let's share those results. As you can see, we've got a lot of powerful leaders in the room. We have 46% of those represented today as senior leaders. Uh, it looks like uh, coming in next is our managers or people leaders, I call them, which could include your supervisors. So that's at 28%. And folks like me, those individual contributors are coming in at 20%. And then we always have those others in the room. So thank you to you for joining us as well. So those are our results. But what I do want to say before we uh, sort of go on to the next slide is there are no wrong or right answers here in terms of being present and available for this webinar. Uh, regardless of your former title, we do believe that everyone here is a leader. And that is actually the key component of what we are going to be talking about here today. Um, I'll also say to you, if you are an individual contributor and you're working in an, in an environment, an organizational environment, according to studies, cultural competency will be one of the most sought after skills for future leaders. So as our work environments become more and more competitive, do know that building your competency around your uh, knowledge and inclusion as you'll be doing as you're working in the build environment is, is very, very helpful to building your skill set. So when we talk about the inclusive leader, who are we talking about? Well, there are hundreds of definitions out there of leadership, probably as many as there are leaders. But the definition we've selected today here is someone who seeks out diverse perspectives to ensure that insights are profound and decisions are robust, robust, I should say. And so if you read that, there's nothing about the role and how many direct reports you have. So regardless of your response to the polling question, individual contributor, senior leader, manager, you have a responsibility to be an inclusive leader regardless of your formal role. And that responsibility comes anytime you make a decision. You should seek out diverse perspectives to ensure that you're making the best decision for your organization, for your team, for your group as possible. So if you want to talk a little bit about, so why is inclusive leadership essential during a time of crisis? You'll see there on the slide where we put some of those reasons, including the fact that as you've already noticed with COVID-19, crisis outstrips the leadership capacity of any single leader or actually any single entity. Uh, then there are reasons. These reasons help the team look at things differently. It reassures staff. When you're in a, uh, operating in a time of crisis, knowing that I'm being heard and I'm being included, it really improves my morale. So that is another reason for why there is inclusive leadership necessary during these times. It also allows everyone to contribute fully to the success of the team. So these are reasons for inclusive re leadership in times of crisis. But as you know, these are essential all the time. 
I think the reason we assume they might be a little different in times of crisis is because the context is different and the set of priorities might be a little bit different, but the set of competencies are the same. And so if you'll note there, as I said, employees, the community and shareholders expect leaders to use every possible tool to find solutions during a crisis. And I, I, I think we can just note our current crisis in the uh, I don't think I've seen Illinois or Chicago leadership or government leadership on display as much as I have during this crisis. But the same applies to your organization. So again, these are the reasons why inclusive leadership is essential, particularly during this time of an epidemic that we're going through. Now, if you are a person who prefers to have a sort of some illustration of, okay, Deb, I heard you, but give me the facts. So take a look at this slide. It's intended to illustrate productivity and speed of three types of teams uh, that were studied as they were facing challenges and crisis. Now, if you look at that slide there, diverse teams not well managed, they're in the blue. And then on the orange, you'll uh, I'll see diverse teams that are well managed. And right in the middle there, you see homogeneous teams that are well managed in green. And if you look to the y-axis, the vertical, the left side, that's the productivity of each of those teams during times of crisis. And if you look at the X or the horizontal bottom, it illustrates the time it takes to accomplish things during times of crisis. So what you'll find there is the more diverse the team, the more important it is to practice inclusive leadership. Now, if that comes as a surprise for you, uh, that is research. It says, according to research, diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams two to one. But if your team is not diverse, our research shows, first of all, you're missing an opportunity. But if you're diverse and it's not well managed, which is inclusive leadership, you haven't met the pinnacle of your opportunity to produce in time and space. So, what I want you to think about is which of those lines best describes the team you work with right now? Of those three, the orange, the green, and the blue. And where might your team be on the graph as it correlates to both the productivity level and getting things done in terms of the required time? And just think about where those gaps might be for you. Just an opportunity to think about it there. Okay. So we also talked about the fact that we were going to give you a few examples, and we're going to call these battle-ready leadership. Uh, my mom, I always thought it was my mom, but who was a former teacher, but it, apparently it was Theodore Roosevelt who said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. And so we thought it would be good to use just a few references to history as we sort of support you and help you in understanding the uh, value of inclusive leadership during these times. So we, what we thought is we take these reminders of how history in this country applied inclusion in their military strategies. And uh, we largely focused on World War II to give you just a few examples. And one of those, which none should be really unfamiliar for you, but you've probably heard of the WASP, the Women Air Force Service Pilots. They were actually civilian women who became trained pilots who not only tested aircraft, they ferried the aircraft, and they actually trained other male pilots. So very, very instrumental during that time. Another one you can think about here is the Tuskegee Airmen. There were a group of African-American and Caribbean-born military pilots who also fought and run very successful missions during World War II. Then another diverse group that contributed during World War II was the Japanese infantry. Uh, they were one of the most decorated units in American military history. And again, that's that diverse con contribution and diverse leadership. In addition, the infantry regiment from Puerto Rico. In World War II, there were probably more than 65,000 Puerto Rican service members who volunteered in this war effort. And I will note that was despite being subjected to much of the racial discrimination that other groups faced. And then the last one had, we have as just a friendly reminder is the Native American Code Talkers. That was a group of Native Americans in the U.S. Marine Corps who used their native language as a secret code to support transmission of messages across the, the, the war zones. 
So as we see in these examples, leadership demanded, I think it was really kind of people rising up, emergent leadership, where leadership demanded uh, and forced us to challenge our assumptions about what various groups could do, from women to various people of color. And for you, the reason I'm presenting you with this historical messaging here is nothing gets soldiers off the sidelines and into battle like knowing that someone believes in them. So when you look across your group at those who may not look like you as you're preparing to continue the work you're doing during this time of crisis, really challenge yourself to think beyond your assumptions of what individuals can contribute during this time. And that really is the core of inclusive leadership, if you will. So what I thought I'd do also is bring a, a couple of examples from other moments of crisis. So to choose there, we looked at Hurricane Katrina, which as you may recall was August 29th of 2005. There you'll find a lot of examples, but the one I pointed out here that you'll see on the screen is just the varying difference in communication because when we talk about the traits of an inclusive leader, we will focus on communication as one of those traits. But if you look there, you've got a comparison of two groups, and many of you may have read this. It became a lot of debate for us where there was this comparison in the same water of a black male wading through the water with a caption that said, quote, looting a grocery store. And then if you look at the uh, communication in the picture below that, it shows a white couple also wading in the water. But this caption says they are shown, quote, after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. So the lesson here in terms of our moments of crisis is as you're communicating, remember your own conscious and unconscious bias and how they might contribute to the words or the language you're using. And that's why we talk about it. So do really keep that in mind as you move forward. Also on the right-hand side, something a little bit closer to home for many of us was the July 1995 Chicago heat wave. That was like a, a record week of heat. And actually it's a really good illustration of times of crisis and the need for inclusive leadership. We had 739 heat related deaths in Chicago over those five days. And most of the victims of the heat wave were poor elderly residents of the city. Now what the analysis showed that blacks were more likely during that time to have died from heat related incidents. And we'll talk a little bit more and you've heard Roberto speak about it, but the inequities, but the inequities that were noted as a cause for the death is there were those who could not afford air conditioning and some that did not open their windows or sleep outside for fear of crime. So the good news about the lessons learned when I arrived in Chicago in 1999, there was another heat wave. Well, this one, that was a much more inclusive emergency response and actually there were a, a extremely less death. I think there were a little over a hundred during that time. Now you see in the lower right that I've included kind of an illustration there, Cook Survival by Zip Codes. Just wanted to note that if you were interested in learning more from that historical perspective, there's a docu documentary that has been produced about that heat wave and the role structured racism played. I think it's courtesy of uh, One Earth Film and you can go out and see that if you really want to see more about that. Okay, so it's really challenging for me because I don't know if you're out there. So polls are one way that I can understand and learn from you. So what we'd like to do is introduce our next poll right now. And in that poll, what we'd like to do is we're gonna ask you a little bit about your own perspectives. In your experience, what's the main reasons leaders are not more inclusive? And the reason we're asking that, I've tried to give you some value. You know, I've told you some historical perspective. We've talked about through illustrations what inclusively led diverse teams can do. But let's kind of get your opinion with all of that as our background drop. Research shows organizations in all sectors continue to struggle to practice inclusive leadership. So in your experience, what's the main reason leaders are not more inclusive? So you've got a lot of choices out there and I see folks are voting. Some folks say, we just don't see the value in more being more inclusive debt. Others say, hey, I like your data, but I need more proof that it's worth the effort. And then we're finding folks that are talking about and uh, voting on, we prefer 
to rely on those go-to people, particularly in times of crisis deaths, it's just a little bit risky to trust others. And then you have a fourth option here. I am open, but I don't know how to do it on a regular basis. And again, this is where this work uh, webinar and other uh, contributions might help you. And then lastly, uh, there's the option that I believe in inclusivity, and I think others do, but we just don't have the time to focus on it. So we've got a lot of votes coming in. We've got a few more opportunities for you to think about that. And if I haven't said so already, this is anonymous. So I really want you to just put your best foot forward in terms of helping us get data in this context of why leaders are not being more inclusive. Okay, so we've got a lot of votes in. And so in five, four, three, two, one, I'll end the polling here. And here are the results. And so as you can see, they're leading the way as to the main reason leaders are not more inclusive is because they prefer to rely on trusted go-to people. So thank you for the, 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 the honesty there. Uh, following that, it looks like 26% uh, of us voted that most leaders don't know how to do it on a regular basis. You know, it is a, a, a practice like anything. And then it sounds like next, uh, we have 12% that do feel that most leaders believe in inclusivity, but don't have the time to focus on it. And then we have as uh, the next leader of 9%, uh, leaders are not more inclusive because they don't see the value in being more inclusive. So a lot of more work around the business case, I think is what those folks are wanting. And then 6%, uh, which speaks a little bit to the business case as well, feels like we need more proof that it's worth the efforts. So thank you for sharing that. That is very uh, important to us that we receive this sort of understanding as we develop as a team, other ways to support you in the work that you do. Okay, so as we move to the next slide, what we'll do is we'll talk about traits of inclusive leadership. Uh, one of the things you talked about was I just don't have the time, got those go-to people who can get the work done, but honestly, and you don't know how to do it on a regular basis or don't have the time. So we're gonna to try to build up that muscle, if you will, uh, to, to provide you with some of the things to help you build your skills as inclusive leaders in the next few slides. What we'll be sharing is that types of behaviors that are common among inclusive leaders as a way to really support you in and through this process. So one of the things I'd like to share is this is a uh, quote from Dr. Anand. She was one of my mentors and is still a mentor and she's the former chief diversity officer of Sodexo. And she offers us advice on the best approach on how to become a better inclusive leader, which is what many of you said we need to do in the polling. And what she says there is inclusive leadership starts with self-awareness, being introspective, knowing your blind spots, and possessing the ability to listen. Okay, so we're going to take those a few elements at a time, including starting with being self-aware. We can all benefit from being self-aware, and I call that knowing my blind spots. And when it comes to knowing my blind spots, I think one of the most important things I have to think about is knowing the part that bias plays in that. And you've heard a lot about bias, and one of the definitions here is going to be around unconscious bias. This is a quick and often inaccurate judgment based on limited facts in our own experience. That's how we get there, particularly research shows that when we're stressed, we often default to our gut instincts. So do very careful when doing, in terms of doing that as you go through these times, because these biases can show up in so many ways, including the way we hire, even the way we uh, make our decisions around cutting back our workforce, how we deliver feedback, meetings, and just the day-to-day -day opportunities. So I'm gonna share with you, and again, these will be available for your uh, continued consumption in our upcoming um, a release of this uh, webinar, but here are some of the forms of biases that I would say you really do need to watch out for as you're operating during this time of crisis. One is affinity, just a tendency to gravitate toward those like us. Another one of those is attention, deciding what to notice and ignoring everything else. That's a, a very common, almost unconscious bias that comes up when you're making these decisions. Confirmation bias, considering only information that confirms your point of view, beware. 
And then there's distance bias, which we're starting to experience, which is the tendency to favor those who are closer to us, sometimes in time and sometimes it's in space. So while we believe we treat everyone equally, these are just four examples of hundreds of uh, unconscious, almost thousands of unconscious biases that are out there. So as you kind of go along, think about those biases and how they might impact your ability to lead in a crisis. Another part of that being self-aware that I really want you to think about is to distinguish between equity and equality. And if you'll see from the slide, if you'll read, if you look at that first image, it assumes that everyone will benefit from the same support. So as you see there, everybody's got their little box. They're trying to watch the game, but they are being treated equally. If you go to that second image, individuals are given different levels of support to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game. Now that's being treated equitably. I'll also push the envelope because you may have heard these a lot, but there's actually one more that I would say here, which is really to talk about um, how we can see the game without any support or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. There was a wall there. I don't know if you see it, a, a sort of a, a wood fence that has been, uh, that barrier has been removed. And in our organizations, that's what we need to do as well. I'll just kind of note real anecdotally, when we think about the payroll protection program, it's being reported that many of the banks actually prioritize the applications early on to their wealthiest clients before turning to other secrets. Now, for me, there was a barrier there that didn't allow a DEI or an equity lens. And so the path for many small businesses, which are minority women, but own businesses and nonprofits were not equal. And keep in mind that inequity creates uh, issues and challenges well into the future. So I hope that helps you. We're also going to provide you with in this uh, presentation just a few considerations that you should really consider in times of crisis. And sure, if you're in a position where you're operating from a uh, distancing workplace at home, that you're getting all the access of technology and supplies to your remote workers. That also includes as you're beginning to collaborate with upcoming uh, events and still trying to build that connection with the community. Understand that we all have different levels of connectivity. We may need different devices. Even in your virtual meetings, consider things like using closed captioning, sending documents in advance. Uh, you'll see things that just talk about, you know, really showing up if you've got ship workers. Hello, let's make sure they're not out there alone on an evening ship. Um, uh, True inclusive leader shows up to show their support. And then this is also an opportunity. We talked about those go-to people and it's really, you want to concentrate on those. Here's a time where you can make and advance more go-to people by allowing an investment in employee development. There's a lot of the LinkedIn and other learnings that can be taking place as virtual sessions to build the skill set of your folks during this time. So most importantly, I say, just ask if it's possible. Just allow your employees to kind of let you know what will help them to feel more equitable during this time of crisis. You can do that in many, many ways. Some organizations have created surveys. But if you do nothing else, the one thing I ask you to do is be forgiving if a child interrupts your Zoom meeting, okay? That's the only one that I ask there. And so if we move on, I want to also talk about or mention something here that's important to be aware of still is one of those self-awareness and it sometimes makes people uncomfortable. It's privilege. And so here's an easy way to remember privilege. If you don't have to think about it, it's a privilege. It doesn't make us a good or a bad person, but it's important that we think about that and remember it. So keep that in mind as part of your self-awareness and inclusive leadership. So we've talked about self-awareness as a key trait or characteristic for inclusive leaders, but leading with empathy is also important. And that's really the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. And that's exactly what I uh, would like to do with this next slide is to really help you kind of think about ways to meet people where they are. And what that means is that you don't just lead uh, across the board, you really think about what individuals need. You treat people with sincere consideration and genuine concern. One of the things on this slide I'd like to note is the emotional labor. It was a sociologist uh, term that came out in probably about 1983, 
Well, what it says is that staff not only have to perform their jobs, but particularly during crisis, they have to control their own emotions in order to better manage the emotions of others around them. And so that's extra work. Emotional laborers are more likely to experience high levels of stress and burnout. And as you may already feel yourself, many of us are managing that emotional labor span uh, with the work we're doing right now. And also as you are considering your inclusive leadership approach of leading with empathy, be sure to think about specific populations. Consider there are populations that have a disproportionate burden of responsibility right now, which is that emotional label. Uh, they have for child, family, home, and health care. And actually for some, particularly the African-American and Latino communities, caring for the not only the family, extended family, but the impact that COVID-19 is having on the larger community. So I hear a lot that the virus is an equal opportunity crisis. However, if you think about that from an empathy standpoint, it reminds us that the impact and the burden of COVID-19 is not shared equally and is being felt disproportionately. So do be sure as an inclusive, inclusive leader to lead with equity. Another thing I would suggest in terms of traits is to collaborate. This is where you get to engage in a range of perspectives. And you go, okay, Deb, yeah, I want to be a millionaire, but why do you have that visual over there? Well, I'm just reminding you, if you've been a fan of that show, you know, you have your three choices there, you know, the 50-50, ask a phone a friend, ask the audience. And all data shows that with rare exceptions, ask the audience was all, when that happened, it was always the right answer. And it wasn't because a particular person in the audience is any more likely than you to know that where the answer, but it's the collective intelligence of the group that's almost always a better bet. So collaboration, again, is very important. There was also a show called Wisdom of the Crowd, but there was also a book. It was really based on the book and the research of one particular individual. And in that book, he quotes that groups that are too much alike find it hard to keep learning because each new member is bringing less and less information to the table. And so what you find is during crisis, we need innovation. And that's where inclusive leadership comes into play. So the, we've talked about the traits. And here we have the fourth trait of inclusive leader, which is to communicate and do it frequently. And I promise you, I know, I know, that image violates our social distancing. I can see the mirror uh, of Chicago somewhere around me right now, noting my slide deck. But I wanted to use this as a visual of how open, authentic communication can make one feel. So even though you may not be getting that close, um, do continue to build the relationships and use communication because silence, it just bears out fear and mistrust and disengagement. So be sure people need communication during a time of crisis and they need it transparently. So be sure to um, ensure that your message may vary across channels. And even when you're continuing to find challenging ways to collaborate and continue developments with communities and, and build community partnerships, be sure to leverage the different types of community, communication channels. Also new connections. What that means, reach out to those that you don't normally have direct communication. Remember, it's not just important to say my virtual door is open. This could be a chance for you leaders, and I saw a lot of senior leaders in this room who you've not been in direct contact on a regular basis with some of your employees that may feel a little different, may not be go-to. Here's a great time to embrace and make them feel more comfortable maybe making those personal connections. And the last two bullets there really speak to vulnerability. We've heard a lot of that from the author, uh, Brene Brown, but now's the time to practice that. And especially if you don't know the answer, it's okay. If the answer has changed, you can acknowledge that. So these are just, again, ways to continue to build that leadership traits and competencies there. So we've given you sort of four traits of an inclusive leader. And as I mentioned, these are just only a couple few that we could include in this time frame. But one of the things you probably already guessed is crisis leadership done correctly is inclusive leadership whether good and bad times. Now, I promise you, it's not to say that it's easy, but our habit of thinking and practicing, we've developed those over years. And redirection will take time, but it's something you've got to practice. So included in the deck, you'll find some suggestions of everyday practices that you can do. And I would suggest picking a few of those, whether it's sharing or what we talked about, about self-awareness, 
actively listening. And I mean, actively not thinking about what you're going to say after they finish what they're saying. And one of the things that's really, really challenging, I said uh, privilege, that's a tough topic. But whatever the topic, lean into the discomfort. I'll call it getting comfortable with the discomfort. And that doesn't just apply here. It applies in everything we're doing because there's so many new ways and things and demands that are happening. And we also talked about, you know, acknowledging receipt, uh, acknowledging mistakes, but I'd also say apologize for those. That makes a deeper relationship when you can accept responsibility. Uh, you'll see something that says there, avoid trigger words. So you might be saying, what are those, Deb? Words like them, those people, even definitive statements like always and never. Just watch your trigger words. And when you're talking about experience, use I language. Let everyone speak for from their own perspective. And one, uh, you know, we kind of started this uh, conversation at a time when we were attempting to be more inclusive, but people have their own beliefs. There's still a lot of differences in beliefs and how the crisis is being managed at all levels. However, as a leader, you should expect your staff to behave respectfully toward one another in and out of the workplace. You don't manage their beliefs, but you do manage their respectful behavior. So that sort of gives you in a nutshell, just a kind of quick uh, advanced look at some of the traits and tools of becoming an inclusive leader in a time of crisis. We want to also leave you with a few uh, resources because you want more, right? Of course you want more. So here you have some of those uh, resources that can help you on your journey. If you look in the middle there, the green, that's actually a product of, uh, and you've probably seen it, Elevated Chicago. They prepared it for leaders and practitioners working in the front lines of community engagement. But I would recommend it to so I've even applied and stole shamelessly for some of the groups I'm working with. And you can find that on the Elevated Chicago website. Also, we did a little bit of teasing you with some of the biases. But if you'd like to explore that more, and if you haven't already, Harvard Implicit Association Tests, the IAT, is a tool that many, it's an anonymous tool, but it can actually help you gain better awareness of your assumptions that you might be making around preferences like weight, gender, age, race, there are a lot of different topics out there, and it's free. So you can go to the website at implicit.harvard.edu. Also, the CDC has developed guidelines to reduce the stigma that we've seen, including racism and scapegoating of some groups that are facing COVID um, due to COVID-19. And you can find that at the CDC website, the cdc.gov, uh, going to coronavirus for more information. Okay. So in conclusion here, I just want to really etch this in your brain. This is what I want you to take away. If you don't intentionally deliberately and proactively include, you will unintentionally exclude. So you should go out into your communities and you make the collaborative efforts uh, in the build environment. Do remember, it, inclusion is an intentional effort and it does take time. It does a lot, have a little bit of discomfort. I'll say a lot of discomfort, but with that, we can really, really work toward the, the visions that are out there. So I want to thank you for your time. If I can offer any personal assistance, feel free to reach out. And uh, what I'm hoping is I've also passed the test with the, the Elevated Chicago team. And I look forward to continuing to work with you and the organization on the journey. So next, what we have is that uh, we will find that Q&As will be led by, I believe, Roberto. Roberto, I'll let you kick it off. And I will look forward to addressing any questions that come to mind. So let me turn it over to Roberta. Thank you, Deb. Um, wow, um, I've known Deb for a few years now, and I learned a lot uh, from her. And I really wanted to thank you because one, like, once again, you have uh, I've learned a lot through this presentation. Things I hadn't thought about, and things that are helping me right now to think through where have I been exclusive lately and where do I need to be more intentionally inclusive both with people and organizations that I may have not been in touch with. So thank you for, for this very uh, robust, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, Kendra and I will be managing the, the Q&A and I wanted to start just by kicking it off with uh, one question that occurred to me um, and I think some of our uh, uh, members uh, or, or participants may have a similar 
a question, which is, um, you know, I get the need to be an inclusive leader. And I think a lot of folks or everybody in this call probably gets that that's a need. But during this global pandemic, when organizations have limited resources and are facing the possibility of cutbacks or uh, layoffs, et cetera, why do you think should there be a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Like, how do you keep those leaders of those corporations, um, government accountable to this and remind them that this is really important when they are dealing with all these other things? And I think you are still muted. Thank you for that. That's a great question. And I know there, there's a lot to consider these days, but I think more than ever, we do need to continue our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would say, because of its economic impact, you know, it is the right thing to do, but this absolutely makes good business sense. We've seen so many organizations, even pre-COVID-19, that found themselves sort of um, losing revenue or losing readership or even losing consumers because of the lack of focusing on DEI. So it is from a perspective of uh, actually growth and productivity, which is what we're gonna be focusing on as we continue to, to move away from this pandemic, is DEI is gonna be very essential in that. And that includes when you're looking through the lens of things like if you're doing layoffs, you know, really looking at the value of employees, looking through the equity lens at what you're offering and not. And you'll even look at things like, uh, I would probably say, Anything that you would do in progression toward your DEI efforts, if you discontinue those, you've set yourself back. So it's a journey. And so as you move along that journey, failure to continue that journey will result in regression. So that's kind of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I wanted to uh, remind uh, all the participants that you can ask questions through the Q&A button. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, we are collecting a few of them. And uh, before I pass the mic to uh, to Kendra, I have another question that um, has been uh, in, in running around our circles. Those of us who are more involved in community development and the built environment, a lot of the leaders and practitioners we've talked to lately have been worried about the impact of COVID-19 in specifically in community engagement. Uh, from community meetings to public comment processes uh, to providing feedback about uh, you know new structures, infrastructure, buildings that are coming into uh, neighborhoods. Our community engagement processes here in Chicago were already hard, very hard to access by community residents before uh, COVID-19. So where do you think we should we start to build a better normal on that on that front? Where, where should we go first? What should we start doing? Well, I say the first thing, and I say this to whether you're part of the community, developers, the government that may be feeling that anxiety. I think I've even heard you refer to it as running around like chickens with our head cut off, right? What I would recommend is the first thing you do is to breathe. Again, when we're in sort of that anxiety state, we don't make our best decisions. We don't think inclusively. So how we get the work done, it is going to be a challenge, but I would recommend really taking a breath. And then uh, I, I recommend it as one of the resources, the community engagement brochure that Elevated Chicago has created. I remember one of the first uh, engagement rules was to change your mindset. And so I hope that's what we've been doing a little bit with the work we started today and the work that Elevated Chicago will continue. So many of the things that we talked about in terms of how to collaborate, how to be more self-aware, how to really uh, communicate in varying ways, particularly when it comes to the meetings or how you receive the comments or looking at the inequities as you think about how you're receiving what you need to be very inclusive. Really kind of think those things through. But again, I'll start with breathe because we become more conscious when we do that. And then to continue to really think about these efforts to change our mindset, to be more inclusive, we can get it done. But I'm, I'm not gonna sit there because I'm not the expert in the room. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kendra and see if she can add anything there. All right, thanks, Deb. Um, I think this is a question we've been wrestling with at MPC as we have, um, programs that are external facing that work very closely with communities and we're trying to think outside the box. Um, I think now more than ever before, it's important to center the voice of community stakeholders who are most impacted um, by the ramifications of, of this pandemic. And, and I think it's been 
easy for us, for those who are privileged to have access to things like Zoom and um, other technology to just think we can just have a Zoom meeting. Well, you can't really think about that because you have to think about what limitations people may have. Everyone may not have a laptop. Maybe people need uh, ways that are more accessible by their phone. Um, so I think, you know, being thoughtful of what limitations may be and how do you overcome those is really important. So I'm one of the things that we've been doing is just making phone calls. You know, I think community engagement professionals are like dusting off old, old school kind of methods like phone trees and flyers and stuff to make sure, um, at at least a hyper local level, people are able to access and share information. But I think also social media is another opportunity of, Kind of looking differently at using Instagram um, to create um, Instagram or Facebook or any of other mediums to create virtual engagement where people are not just looking at content but able to respond and give feedback um, in ways that may be more accessible or reachable for them. So I think it's an ongoing question that that, that needs to, that needs uh, our our creativity. Um, but I think we don't we should not abandon um, the need to continue to talk to people. Um, at the community level at various levels just because it's a little bit harder now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. And I wanted to thank also our uh, national network, Spark, who are also part of our uh, funders. They have been really looking into this uh, issue and we're hoping soon to share the results of a webinar they did last week about specifically community engagement where more than 150 people showed up to the, to the, to the virtual meeting and showed us the, the, the hunger that exists out there for, for direction on how to do community engagement better. So thank you both. I'm going to let now uh, Kendra take it from here because we're getting uh, a lot of questions from our audience. Yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and start with the first question. And Deb, this is referring to the slide, uh, Teams During Challenges slide. So the question is, why do diverse teams take longer to produce than homogeneous? I see well-managed teams surpass homogeneous productivity, but why is there a gap shown on the left earlier in time? That's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, if you'll allow me uh, to maybe share my screen one more time on that, I'll go back to that topic so that others can see that particular slide. And as I'm doing that, to answer your question, and thank you for the question, the reason is the differences. You know, when we're all connected and we're all, uh, one of the things that, and I was hoping I could find it really, really quickly. So bear with me here. I'm almost there. There it is. Going to put it in slide mode there for you. And, oh, well. To answer that question for you, the biggest uh, gap between the team that is diverse but not performing at this top level is the conflict that occurs there. There are differences and differences have to be managed. So when we talk about being diverse, what inclusion does is actually allows voices to be heard, but not all things that every person says comes into play as the right answer, but we're creating innovation through that. So that really big gap is where inclusion comes into play because when you are in uh, diverse teams, but they're not managed, you've just got a lot of people who are thinking and doing and differences, not valuing one another's opinions and the efforts. So that's where your inclusive leadership will come into play. So I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, next question. I'd be interested to hear advice on how to be more inclusive with community and resident engagement when it can only be conducted through solely digital means. As someone working in government, it's challenging conducting only virtual outreach, knowing that digital access is not equitable especially for those without computers and senior populations? This is a great talk. That's an excellent question. I think, Kendra, you already kind of led us into some of that. I believe some of that is going to require the old school approach. We do pick up the phone. We do have our phone trees. We better engage folks through uh, email or other conversations. It's certainly, as the uh, uh, question addresses, it's not a Zoom meeting. That's not going to resolve it. I think we're going to find in a socially distanced manner we need to have the ability to engage and connect with one another, but we're also going to have to build that across our team. So we're going to have to think differently as to who we reach out to with the value time that we have, really targeting what voices are not in the room. How do we get those voices in the room? How do we figure out in an innovative way? And part of 
figuring out the innovation is getting folks in the room to declare, hey, we've got a privilege here. We have this opportunity through digital means, but how do we connect to those who don't have that privilege or that equity? So uh, Kendra, I'm gonna kind of add, I'll see if you have anything to add, but to me is really going back and really rethinking this from almost the, the old school perspective, if you will. Anything you could uh, think of Roberto or Kendra to add there? Uh, I would I would just add that um, I think uh, we need to fundamentally rethink completely the ways that we have uh, engaged with with community, especially as it relates to what happens when uh, a big development or even a small development comes into a neighborhood and is uh, presented, uh, sponsored, uh, funded by people who are not from the area and don't have roots there, cultural competency, or even direct connections. Um, and um, one thing that is always being very shocking to me is that often when you go to those meetings, the conversation just goes to the point. It's just like, here's what we're doing, what do you think about it, right? And it's not only about engaging people in the design from the very, very beginning, the conceptual stage where you're still thinking, where is this going? What are we doing? But also the way these meetings are run where there's no space at the beginning to do what you just told us to do just to breathe first, second, to put that development in the context of the area and the history of the area, and also to acknowledge who's not in the room, like basic stuff. Uh, I think the rules of engagement are often not present from the very beginning in those uh, community meetings and, and settings. And it really helps to start by acknowledging who is in the room, but also uh, acknowledging who is not, right? And what perspectives are not there and what the plans are to to get to those perspectives. And uh, the other thing that I think we could start doing to uh, thinking about technology and how uh, it's a little a little easier right now through these uh, calls to know who's there and count them quickly and do these polls, et cetera, to kind of commit to some goals, right? Uh, in community outreach, not only number of people that you want to, to include, but also uh, the characteristics of the population, how representative, they're going to be of the of the community that's going to be most affected by the development. So those are some some ideas uh, that I think could be uh, implemented relatively quickly if we all kind of make the most of um, of the technology, but also if we stop for a second and rethink how do we even start the conversation uh, about bringing yet another uh, development to this area. And I see some interesting comments in the chat box. Um, one is about can we engage art as a way of engaging communities, such as making murals that have polling options. So that, you know, that sounds like a really cool idea that somebody should try. This is definitely a time to be innovative. Um, so let's go to the next question. Uh, the question, Deb, is I was surprised to see that well-managed teams and poorly managed teams performed well at the beginning. What are the factors that cause a team's performance to diverge? What causes diverse, well-run teams overtake home, to overtake homogeneous teams? Finally, on the chart, does a crisis occur at the beginning or at some point during time? A lot of questions. Oh, Deb, we can't hear you. I do that every time, so my apologies on that. Uh, I think one of the things that starts there is we have our biases. There is a bias that talks about uh, collaborative bias where we can all tend to agree. And a lot of times when teams are forming and building their dynamics, the leader drives the team versus the team driving the leader. So it's kind of what the leader has to say, how the leader presumes, or this in-group of folks, and everyone else sort of goes along. As we begin to build out a more diverse team, what we start to do is we have to find ways to challenge our assumptions, ensure that there's inclusion, and failure to do that sort of creates that distance or the gap that takes place in terms of productivity. There's also things like that emotional labor we talked about. You know, there is uh, a lot of studies that have been done around voice inflections or, uh, based on women of color and the actual influence that has on the perceptions of those individuals. So there's a lot of time by some of the members of the group who are more diverse to sort of comply or to, to remain sort of uh, go along to get along. And then as you kind of continue to ask for what you really want, which is diversity and inclusion, you tend to see that gap because 
here comes that distinction or that gap between or differing in opinions and things that require that inclusive leadership. So I would say how you sort of get back to that top where you've got both the homogeneous, uh, excuse me, the homogeneous team is now diverse and the leadership really is a, a component of trust, really building that trust that I can, you've heard a lot about bringing your whole self to work. Part of what the variables are there are seeing individuals begin, they're really bringing their whole selves to work and the impact that that could have. And so I say, if you look at that chart, which I'm glad I brought the chart in, it seems to uh, invoke a lot of questions. It's really about having the ability as a leader to really manage that, not to manage it to consensus, but manage it in terms of ensuring that folks are well-respected, that there's trust in the leadership, and that the innovation is adopted through collaboration. So I hope that helps. Can you give some examples of where leaders have effectively led inclusively? Are there specific mm -hmm. tips you have on time management or practices for making space be intentionally inclusive? Well, uh, I think that from a time management perspective, uh, I talk about breathing. You know, we think that takes a lot of our time and it really doesn't. It's profound when you sort of allow yourself to become self-aware and conscious how much time you gain. Because one of the things, I, uh, tips I will give you is you remember back when we did the polling and we talked about what keeps most leaders from being more inclusive? A lot of it was around relying on those go-tos. And so one of the tips I'll tell you is to expand your go-to population. And the way you're gonna expand those may feel from a time management perspective, is taking a little bit more time for you to train someone or build the trust or have the communication with a new person where it's your go-to person, you give it to them and they're gone. But that in the long run is a time management consideration. It's prioritizing the time that you manage by expanding your go-to. Uh, I, I would also say that one of the things that I would probably caution is Really think about you are the leader. So as part of being a leader is delegation. And you want, and we'll go back to our war sort of analogy, you don't want to charge up the hill if you're part of the cavalry and look behind and there's no one following you. So building out your inclusive leadership components so that you can delegate. Individuals feel trusted. They feel comfortable around the risk that you're allowing them to take in terms of expanding your go-to will really support you. So in, in essence, really time management is priority management. What's going to strategically get you more time in the end is what you should think about when you're thinking about your time management. I also just wanted to add that um, uh, I use this book a lot. It's called Inclusion Nudges mm -hmm. by um, Tina Nielsen and Lisa Kapinski, and they're two, uh, two experts in, in inclusion. Uh, there's a, a newer version. And we can, we're going to post some of these resources after after this, this session. But it has a lot of very practical things that take literally five minutes, things you can do during meetings, things that you can do during retreats, things that you can do during your conversations with folks. So there's a, a lot of people kind of collaborating in, in collectively to this book and sending tips. And I'm sure some of you some have some of those. But I strongly recommend for all those of you who, who want some ideas to, to use that resource. And I love it. Oh, I was just going to add, you know, uh, in picking those, you know, you saw us do a slide that said everyday action. As a leader, it's kind of like selecting your exercises for the day. Sort of take a look at those tips that they have, whether they're in the slides, and just kind of consciously think about how you're going to implement that one to two per day and build upon that. Kendra? Great. I was just going to say, is there a nugget of, of the example mm, that gotcha. you wanted to share? Well, what that I've learned about or talked about recently is State Farm. You know, when we all got the shelter in place, uh, and I'm not a State Farm policyholder, so there's no endorsement there. But one of the things they did was they sent out a memo that said, take whatever you need. They told them, you know, we need to ship resources to you, give you new software. There were even folks because of ergonomics that said, hey, I'm going to need this chair that you, you've adopted for me as a reasonable accommodation. I'm going to need that at home. So there was a real intent to instruct folks to take exactly what they need to create the equity. Because I'm always going to go back a little bit of how you make that equitable approach. And I, I thought in this particular crisis, State Farm did a, an excellent job of that in terms of just inviting folks to do what they need. They also, uh, there was another firm who conducted a survey of 
how are you doing? What's happening? And what they found was they had a number of their employees who were having chip tooths during this crisis. You know, they were just uh, sitting home in a, a, a survey and they were coming back with, wow, I need to get to a dentist. My tooth is chipped. But if you think about the correlation of stress and what it's doing for folks, that uh, and then the, the, the particular organization thought about that from how they changed their benefits program to increase their dental coverage for employees just because of this time of crisis. So it's these little things, and again, they're more workplace, but just these little things that you can innovatively think of that could support you. Right. Thanks. What are ways to help create opportunities for more diverse leadership? Um, this is specifically from someone who is an architect and they want to know how to do that in their industry. Um, in long term, you know, just beyond recruitment, how can they create more opportunities for diverse leadership? I think that's a great question. And thank you for asking. And regardless of the, the industry, I think one of the things you have to do is think long term. And that's exactly what it sounds like this individual is doing. So one of the things I would recommend is I would assume even if you're a small organization, you have a secession plan in place. And if you don't, you should, particularly in times of crisis like this. And with that, don't just think about the available employees who kind of show up as those, and I'll keep using the term go to since we heard that a lot, but really think about what it takes to get someone to that ready one or ready two level on your uh, succession plan list. What it takes might mean development. It might mean candid conversations. I worked with a group where there was a really reluctance to share uh, with a particular person of color that the communication style that they had was very uncomfortable and abrasive during meetings. They didn't want to tell her, but the reaction and the lack of promotion left her struggling with why am I so knowledgeable and told I'm so confident and not progressing? So again, looking at what it takes to develop those individuals in the long term. Also looking beyond just the uh, obvious skill sets. I mentioned cultural competency is a leading factor in selections in the future. So as a leadership team, don't just look at those, I call it FIT, F-I-T, although that's a three-letter word. FIT for me is a four-letter bad, bad word. Look beyond who fits nicely into that. Remember the slide with the blue, who fits in and makes you feel you know, very comfortable in some way. Go beyond that, stretch beyond the fit and see how these innovative, creative talents that you're bringing into your organization, how you can allow them to develop in other and new and innovative ways. So again, succession planning, looking at your development list and seeing how you can further expand that and uh, get individuals on that list in terms of readiness. And also take the word fit. If you are ever in an interview and someone says they just don't fit, the next question should be why, because you really do need to explore that. So I hope that helps. Uh, the next question is, if understanding our shared history is important to include to inclusive leadership, what are resources that we can use to do so? Oh, gosh, there's a lot. I mean, in any history bus, feel free to put something in the chat there. But I'd say uh, some of the resources that we can use, as I, I mentioned in the um uh, slide presentation, I had just discovered uh, Cooked, you know, um, the zip code uh, film that's out there. It's a new independent film. It really gives you a real perspective of real time what was happening during that Chicago heat wave of 1995. Uh, any of the history uh, groups that we talked about in World War II, whether it's from the women pilots to Tuskegee Airmen and the other groups. There's a lot of information out there and books written on all of those. Um, I mentioned also uh, the wisdom of the crowd. That wasn't just a, a television series based out of San Francisco where they solved uh, crime through crowdsourcing. It really is a, a book that the sociologist has done a lot of work to su suggest ways that we can look at innovation being a component of really gathering individuals across varying professions and lifestyles and how they come up with much better, um, I would say, end results than those groups who are alike. And then there's another one of my dear friends, his name is Scott Pages at the University of uh, Michigan. And he has a book that he did all this research around inclusion, but it had nothing to do with diversity. It was just looking to see how heterogeneous teams perform so much better in all areas than homogeneous. So he's a lot of research out there and a lot of tips. So I'll be happy. I, I 
heard that Roberto was going to post some resources. So I'll be happy to look up some of those and, and share those for posting, uh, post this conversation. Great. Uh, sometimes our power and privilege can be blind spots for, for being inclusive in our decision making. So what are the privileges, you know, that we should be thinking through as we make big or small decisions? Yeah, excellent. And your awareness with that question is excellent. I think some of the privileges we need to think about, particularly right now, and I'm kind of focused on we're all working from home or, or some of the elements, is the technology privileges we have. There are many communities where there, the technology is not advanced. And I think as developers and others think about sort of the development component, what will it take to improve the, the equity when it comes to technology? I think other things that we need to think about when we think about these, uh, our privileges is, what don't we have to think about? You know, is our family safe? Uh, is our community, when we look around at our relatives, as I call them communities, or the communities that we live in, is there a really big impact right now from COVID-19 or is it kind of a safe and sound community that's distancing itself? So I think there's a lot of challenges around our privilege that really just come with asking or looking across the aisle, if you will, to how with, with empathy, what do I have that someone else doesn't have? I have that technology access. I have the ability to Zoom immediately. I have the ability to even work for home, from home. Keep in mind the many, many populations that are impacted by COVID-19 uh, with the assumption that it's because they are first responders in some way or essential workers in some way. So think through your privilege if you do have the privilege to, to not have that direct impact with the community on a regular basis. Think about that privilege and how you might look at your coworkers or your staff or members or members of the community differently as it relates to that. I don't know, Roberto, any thoughts you wanna add with that one? Uh, maybe not, I was just- Sorry, <laughs> I was muted. I was just saying, no, that was a great, great, uh, great answer uh, that Okay. Uh, this next question is in relation to go-to people. So how, how have other organizations or governments created systems and structures to create safe spaces to bring in new voices and perspectives? I, from the organizations that I've worked with, one of the key elements is we do look at things like, um, uh, for example, I've worked with an organization where we looked at the entry rate, uh, we looked at the data, basically. We looked at the representation. I think uh, Roberto shared a slide of the representation in some of our build uh, environment uh, industries or sectors where the representation of people of color were, were really minimal. And so what they've done is actually created metrics. Uh, they've created uh, resources to talk about how can we better cast our net to be more inclusive in our Recruiting, looking for hiring from a college entry standpoint. What are the uh, colleges and universities that we have on our recruitment list? Are they diverse? They've looked at things like uh, how to tap into the population that we currently have in place, which is diverse, and support them in helping us identify additional candidates. They created things like employee resource groups, and, and those kind of can be uh, affinity groups, if you will, or business resource groups. And those groups have been instrumental in supporting organizations to, to really kind of increase the diversity within the organization. But that's sort of like a, uh, my analogy is you turn on the spigot, you increase the flow, the water flow, but if you don't plug that sink, the retention is going to be very minimal. So when you gravitate to the retention side of that, you really do think of things like development in a different way. What will it take to develop an individual in one situation versus another? How do we really call it risk and measure the risk that we're taking when we're avoiding uh, going with that typical go-to person and saying, I'm going to give this opportunity to another individual? That creates risk, let's be honest, it does. But you minimize and mitigate that risk through the feedback, through the development, through the opportunity to really uh, allow that person to feel engaged. It allows that person to feel that you're committed to them and they will commit to you. And I think uh, when I talk about metrics, it's really measuring the success of your applicant flow, your promotions, even your retention rate of people of color and looking beyond the numbers and looking to the root causes of what is the problem in these variations that we can solve 
not just through numerics or analysis, but through inclusionary approach to our leadership. And this will be the last question we have time for. Um, how do you manage up if senior leadership of the organization is not ready for equitable and inclusive leadership? Ah, that's the question. And anyone who has the answer to that and solves it, I think you're going to get it uh, really, you're going to get the Nobel Peace Prize Award in the future. <laughs> that's an ongoing one. But I, I think manage up, managing up is a delicate balance, certainly. Uh, but I think it does start with walking the talk. If you are a leader who's managing and considering managing up to other tiers of leadership, practicing what you would like to show and have them reflect is the first and most important thing. That's something I always live by is I walk the talk of most necessary and when you're moving up. I think the other way that I found, and it's debatable, but a lot of times we focus on how important, how it's the right thing to do when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it does make good businesses. And there's a lot of research out there, easily accessible, that shares that. So if you've got the opportunity in meetings to, to provide any sort of resources around that, you can certainly do that. Now, that may be uh, a little hard to approach, but again, if you can link any of that back to your organization, I, I think it uh, was just right before the um, COVID-19 pandemic that we uh, heard that uh, for firms that are going to be advancing uh, to be part of the uh, stock exchange in the future, they are going to require that they have diverse boards. Is that because it's the right thing to do? Yes. But it's also good business sense because they, studies have found that those are the businesses or the organizations that are the most profitable. So there's a, there's a challenge and a balance there, but I'd say starting with walking the talk, uh, there's opportunities for you to input items. You can maybe even ask for something in your meeting, how you conduct your own meetings with your employees. And then managing up, offer those structures such as a diversity moment. Many organizations have a safety moment, it's essential. A diversity moment would be something that you could add there as a triple effect. But uh, again, sometimes the profit within the zone is not a profit. So if you have opportunities with recognition months that are coming up, be a little bit more creative than just offering those amazing uh, delicacies of different cuisines that we have based on our cultures. But advance that a little bit to, to offer up speakers or engagers who can talk about the value of diversity from their perspective or a book into the book club that can support that. So I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll kind of pause there, Kendra, for the sake of time. Great. Thanks so much, Deb. And thanks for your presentation and, and the conversation. Uh, as we wrap up, I just want to thank all of you who joined us today. Um, thank you for your participation through the chat and through the great questions to really help us dig into this topic a little bit deeper. Again, this is the first uh, of, of, of hopefully three uh, series that we're, that we're going to be sharing with you. And as we, um, as we continue to build that content, we want to hear from you. So a couple of things you can expect from us is one, a survey after this webinar that will ask you some specific questions, giving us feedback on the session, but also asking you for what are the, uh, what are the things, your challenges you're facing within um, your current organizations where a stronger frame for diversity and equity and inclusion will be helpful. We really wanna hear specifically about uh, tools and things that would be helpful for you so we can uh, sculpt um, those next couple of conversations with that in mind. Uh, in future conversations will vary in format. So this is a webinar we were able to open up to a large group of people. Um, but we also want to make sure we're curating smaller conversations that allow people to actually get in discussion with each other. So you can expect that um, from future uh, convenings as well. Uh, we did record this presentation and we'll be sharing that with you very soon. So look out for that as well as the survey. Um, and I just wanted to also just take a moment to again thank Deb Baldwin um, for her time and her expertise and, and the great job she did this morning. Also, Roberto Riquejo and Elevated Chicago, who has supported uh, this effort in, in time and brain space and funding. Um, our brain trust of our design team that's led by Heather Smith and Tiffany McDowell. And then also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank MPP staff, um, particularly uh, Angie Leva and Debbie Liu, who did a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that everything went smoothly <laughs> during this last 90 minutes. Uh, thanks for those of you who were patient with some of the technical challenges uh, in, in navigating this, and we look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks.